Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, December 20th, 2011 edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes. Now we have scheduled a powerful interview from the makers of a noble lie uh, on the Oklahoma City bombing, that is James Lane, as well as a member of the former grand jury, Hoppy Heidelberg. We also have a ton of Ron Paul news, including the statements from Iowa's governor, not only trying to discredit Ron Paul, but also his own state's caucuses. But first, we have a news blitz from Alex Jones. Well, it happened. We believed in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. We believed in a man who'd always kept his word and had a perfect constitutional voting record, Ron Paul. It didn't matter that the establishment said he couldn't win. It didn't matter that they demonized him when they were forced to report on him. Ron Paul went from second to first place in Iowa. He went from third place to first place in New Hampshire. All over the country, Ron Paul is now coming up first or second. He is the front runner, and he's the only one who isn't a carbon taxing, open border promoting, Obama socialist health care loving globalist like Mitt Romney, Newt Gingrich, and others, or for that matter, Rick Perry. And so the Republican establishment is in panic mode. The system isn't going to get its new world order, its control freak nanny state. If somebody like Ron Paul wins the Republican nomination, they're already in panic mode over the fact that he's so prominent in the race when they desperately tried to censor him and black him out of the debates. People are talking about liberty. They're talking about freedom. They're talking about not giving tens of trillions in corporate bailouts to offshore globalist banks. Ron Paul is helping to bring sanity back to this country. He's saying torturing people is wrong, that the CIA being caught bringing drugs into this country is wrong. And he's being called a kook, a nut, a lunatic by an establishment that is out of bullets, that is losing all of its credibility, that people aren't listening to anymore. The system noted that they pulled out all the stops on the Republican and Democratic uh, system from both sides to attack Rand Paul in Kentucky last year, and that that only backfired on them because the system is so discredited. So now they're really resorting to a new level of dirty tricks. We demanded that Ron Paul run for office. We made the point that even if you lose, we win because you inject real issues. We demanded that Ron Paul run because resistance is victory. Even if he doesn't win the nomination or win the presidency, we're in the game. We're pointing out real issues that shows that we have a two-party dictatorship in this country. And now that Ron Paul's in there, we've got to defend him. We've got to stand with him. The traitorous sellout Republican Party that's in league with the Democratic traitors is desperate. They're in panic mode. And so they're taking an old trick but adding something new to it. They're saying, if Iowans vote for Ron Paul, they're basically wasting their vote. But more than that, they are discrediting Iowa and that if Ron Paul wins Iowa, that Ron Paul discredits the caucus system itself and how presidential nominees are picked. Now, Ron Paul's not doing that. Ron Paul supporters who are the voters in the caucus, they're not the people that are doing that. It's the governor attacking the electoral process. It's the governor bringing into question the election system. It's the governor assaulting the voters, but they spin it that it's Ron Paul. You know, if Ron Paul standing for election happens to win, he discredits Iowa, so don't waste your vote on him. It is just an incredibly dirty trick, but I believe will backfire if we get the word out and if you get this video and the articles we've written about it at Infowars.com out to everybody. I mean, look at the mind control. Look at how brazen and naked this is. The governor, Politico, and other operatives come out in droves with a talking point that if Ron Paul wins, forget it. Uh, look at you know, number two, Mitt Romney. And that Ron Paul's discrediting the process when they're the ones trying to discredit the process and telling voters what they believe in and what they stand for isn't valuable. They've already told you how to think, saying you can't vote for Ron Paul, he won't win. Now they say if he wins, it's a loss for Iowa and that they'll be discredited and the Iowa caucus uh, won't be the important kickoff of the election it's been for many decades. That is mind control. That's them saying, hey, you're trendy. You're into whatever we tell you. 
Uh, so do what you're told and shut up and vote for Mr. Carbon Taxes, Mr. Abortion, Mr. Open Borders, Mr. Author of Obamacare, Mitt Romney. Or if you don't like him, go for Mr. Same as Romney, Newt Gingrich. You can't have Ron Paul. The corrupt establishment that's taken this country over is freaking out and really showing their hand right now. And showing that they think if they tell you that our state will be embarrassed if you do this, that you're so weak-minded that you'll go along with that. I want everybody to get this uh, special news report from InfoWars Nightly News that I'm breaking down right now and get it out to everybody you know because they are scared of him. I mean, here's one of the headlines out of Politico. Will Ron Paul kill the caucuses? And it goes on to say that he's a threat to the state's cherished kickoff status. And if he wins, they're discredited. They think you're a bunch of mindless people who just do whatever you think is popular. It's, it's, it's all of this peer pressure driven, advertisement based bull that has taken us from the most wealthy and most respected country in the world to one of the most indebted and universally reviled and hated because we've allowed criminals to take over our system because we sit there and let the men in the nice suits tell us how to vote. It is incredible. So get these articles and this video out to everyone you know and point out the arrogance and hubris of the Republican Party that is so scared of Ron Paul. As I told Politico and other publications, when Rand Paul was running, I said, don't you get it? The more you demonize him, the more dirt you try to dig up, the more crap you make up, the higher his poll numbers go. And they're doing the same thing with Ron Paul. Now, in closing, the anonymous group says they're going to hack things because they're mad at Ron Paul. That's the feds. But the feds are going to come in and try to oversee it now. So, of course, they can then claim that the hack uh, through confusion into the vote. So they say Ron Paul won, but is it true? They're doing anything they can to engage in mind control and manipulation. But if you're aware of it, and if you understand the type of staged events they pull off, their power over all of us is broken. Break the trance. Now, continuing with tonight's news report, I want to get into the nanny state because just today I saw... This stack of articles in front of me. Every day I see these type of reports and I've almost become numb to it. We cannot let ourselves become numb to it. Remember when they said that they were going to have trash inspectors, that it wasn't going to be associated with fines a few years ago, even though they'd done that in Europe? And even though the company setting it up said that that was part of the model? Look at this headline out of My Fox. Public Works defends fine for not recycling cat litter, $2,000 fine. And what are they doing? They're digging through your trash. Continuing, here is another one. This is out of Queens. Trash can tickets in Queens. They say a, a, a little known law that you have to put your trash cans out at an exact time. Well, residents found that if they put their trash can out 30 minutes early before it's supposed to be out. You put it out when the man says so, they're given a hundred dollar fine. But if you do it a second time, well, it goes up to a thousand. So you'll put your trash can out when your government master says so. Here's another one. Regulators seek ban of cell phone use in cars, even hands-free. Wall Street Journal. Hands-free is completely safe. But they're saying they're going to track with government systems your cell phone use. The police are going to have scanners. And so if they find if your cell phone's in use in the car, why, then you're going to get a big fine. It's all about revenue generation. But remember, as they raise more and more taxes and more and more revenue, notice everything's falling apart, less and less services, because we're going into austerity. Under the globalist model, they want to destroy us economically. It's in the IMF and World Bank documents that came out in the BBC in 2002. They want to destroy the economy, and they're shutting it down. And no amount of new taxes will ever pay off all these fake debts. It's designed to shut down the economy. It's a monopoly implosion program, just like we see happening in Europe right now. Now, finally, I have this article that a listener mailed us, and you can look at it online and pull it up as well from the Boston uh, newspapers. Lynn Woman Charged Over Feeding Ducks at Park. AP reports an 80-year-old Lynn woman was criminally charged Wednesday because she refuses to stop feeding flocks of ducks and geese that officials, not servants, but officials, say are littering a pond and park with waste.
And again, they've always got good reasons for this. Hey, when a cop pulled me over and wanted to check my window tent, I looked at him and I said, you know, MF Global has stolen billions of people's private accounts and won't get in trouble. I said, the government puts sodium fluoride in the water, they admit gives you a sevenfold increase in cancer. Uh, I said, uh, the government's getting rid of laws so they can put military on the streets. There's all these huge crimes, but all you're allowed to do is run around and raise revenue. And that's what's disgusting about this. This whole system, this whole nanny state is about making us feel like we're criminals. It's about teaching us to line up and be groped by the TSA in airports and now on highways and watch our children be groped. It's about the general public who's not criminal learning how to be a perp, learning how to be treated like a criminal, learning that we've got something to prove to the state and all of us are suspects until proven slaves, not guilty until proven innocent. We've gone beyond guilty until proven innocent. We are slaves here to be taught that we're guilty. We're being taught and conditioned that we're scum and trash and are always guilty and that only government can be trusted. Only government is our loving mommy and daddy. The globalist, the social engineers, the control freaks in their own admissions want to implode society to make us all dependent on them so they can socially engineer us in their image. They must be met with truth, they must be met with courage, they must be faced down. Because they know that we're waking up, and so they're accelerating their program. And incredible tyranny is now upon us. Last night we broke the report that not only did Halliburton subsidiary KBR get the master contract to now prepare the subcontractors to man the camps, they've built them, now they're getting ready to man them. But now we've gotten the master federal bid when they put it out to companies and have direct links to it on homelandsecurity.gov website. And still, the mainstream media won't touch this. And they're not going to come grab you and take you to a camp and blow your head off day one. No. They're going to sell the camps. We know this from the Model State Health Emergency Powers Act, the Emergency Centers Establishment Act, that it's going to be for the collapse for poor people. And then there'll be security problems and there'll be brigs where the bad people go. That's in all these documents. And they've built them all over the country. People say, why would they want to wreck the economy? Don't they want to make money? The elites issue the money. They control unlimited money through Ponzi schemes. But they've got to have tyranny in place to make sure you accept their fraud. That's like asking, why did Kim Jong-il of North Korea you know, not care about millions of his people starving every few years? It was a form of domination. The sickos that run that country enjoy what they're doing. To people like Hitler and Stalin and Mao, death and destruction is enjoyable because it presses on the nerve of power. They get off on it. And it's only when good people do nothing that these evil people can get away with it. You know the old famous founding father Thomas Jefferson quote, evil men and tyrants flourish when good men and women do nothing. So if you want to know the problem, if you want to know why this is all happening, it's because we left the door open. We let the vampires in. Look in the mirror. It's our fault. Sure, psychopaths, control freaks, they're horrible. They are, at the end of the day, the enemy. But we, the people, by leaving the door open, I mean, if I let the door open where I live, raccoons will raid my house. It's happened to my parents. That's what raccoons do. You leave your doors open to tyranny, it's going to take over. It's our fault for letting them get rid of the Bill of Rights and Constitution, letting them, by a successive approximation, train us to be slaves. I'm Alex Jones reporting from the front lines of the info war. Let's turn this nanny police state around. Let's let these people know that we're not their prisoners. Let's let the criminals know that they're not going to turn our whole country into a giant insane asylum, which they control for their own psychotic and sadistic pleasure. And let's defend Ron Paul. So there you have it from Alex Jones, from petty tyranny regulations and so-called laws to open attempts to strong arm the election to the real big tyranny stuff like putting people in FEMA camps. It really all comes down to the assumed authority of government and the fact that people believe it and obey it. Now we're going to get more into that in a moment. But recall, if you will, Gandhi's quote, that first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they attack you, then you win. 
So what happens then? I guess that's the case here with Ron Paul, that if he wins the Iowa caucus, they're prepared to dismiss the entire dog and pony show of these elections. If you haven't figured it out yet, we do have selected candidates, and they are willing to do some pretty extreme things if the wrong person looks like they're getting into power. I don't mean to employ scare tactics about Ron Paul and what they might do to him, but please remember what they did to Robert Kennedy uh, after he won the California primary, which looked like it was going to launch him into being the Democratic nominee, well, they killed him within minutes. And it wasn't some patsy uh, who couldn't fire that many shots all at once. But getting into detail of that, we have Politico's, Politico's article, Will Ron Paul Kill the Caucuses? That's an article from Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns. Talks about how conservatives and Republican elites in the state are divided over who to support for the GOP nomination, but they, uh, uh, they almost uniformly express concern over the prospect that Ron Paul and his army of activist supporters may capture the state's 2012 nominating contest, an outcome many fear would do irreparable harm to the future role of the first in the nation caucuses. In spin rooms, bar rooms, and online forums, the what to do about Paul conversation has become pervasive as polls show him at or near the top just weeks before the January 3rd vote. Paul poses an existential threat to the state's cherished kicks-off status, say those Republicans, because he has little chance to win the GOP nomination and would offer the best evidence yet that the caucuses reward candidates who are unrepresentative of the broader party. It would make the caucuses mostly irrelevant, if not entirely irrelevant, said Becky Beach, a longtime Iowa Republican who helped Presidents Bush 41 and Bush 43 here in Iowa. It would have a very damaging effect because I don't think he could be elected president, and both Iowa and national Republicans wouldn't think he represents the will of voters. So, in other words, if the actual electorate in an actual vote don't believe what they've been force-fed from the mainstream media and the rest of it, somehow it doesn't count. Somehow they're going to push for the other candidates anyway. Uh, you saw that today with the Iowa governor. We'll get to him in just a moment. You also have Political's Ben Smith blog from four days ago, written by Dylan Byers. One thing is for certain, uh, says an article titled, Ron Paul, enemy of Iowa. One thing is for certain, Deese writes, if a candidate with Ron Paul's foreign policy views wins the Iowa caucuses, that will be the final nail in Iowa's first in nation status. Like it or not, the media and Republican Party itself will simply discredit the results and start the process over in New Hampshire. However, public policy polling has real numbers that show there's an actual, legitimate, statistical argument that Ron Paul would be the strongest GOP candidate against Obama, period, PPP tweeted. The reason Romney usually does better versus Obama than Paul overall is many GOP voters say they're still undecided in Obama versus Paul. Now, the point here is they're trying to demonize the idea that Ron Paul, not uh, tapped by the media as one of their preferred candidates, could actually have a, a following after all this talk of how he couldn't win and how he doesn't have a real following and how all the supporters online are just trolls or somehow manufactured support from over-organized internet groups. It's all made up, folks, and you can see it in the military campaign donations. Another appeal to authority where they tell you to always buy the next war and go with the manufactured candidates who will always start another war. Instead, here's the voice, the vote of consumer dollars in the military where all the military donations from people actually in the military consistently outrank all the other GOP candidates and President Obama as Paul just leads all those categories dominantly. Now, we have comments also from the Ron Paul enemy of Iowa story that show that there, of course, is support for Ron Paul. Uh, Douglas Lair says, so if Iowans don't vote for who they're supposed to, they become irrelevant. What's the point of even voting? Uh, and then a man named Tushar Saxena points out, remember the European ye uh, Treaty re referendums where Ireland was made to vote a second time because it voted, quote unquote, incorrectly the first time. Gee, do you think someone else is running the show here other than the so-called voters? Oh, the silly media. First they ignore Ron Paul. Didn't work. Then they threaten voters' sensibilities by saying he has zero chance of winning. That didn't work. Now they say vote for your favorite candidate 
or we'll, and we'll make your entire state irrelevant. Maybe the media should threaten to stop broadcasting and publishing in Iowa if one of the media's preferred candidates doesn't win. Very appropriate. Bill Dickinson, I wonder how many states will have to be disqualified in this election after Ron Paul keeps winning. And it goes on and on from there. I used to support Fox News, but I realized how biased they are. I've seen the bias against Ron Paul and instead choose to prop up shoddy candidates like Newt and the flip-flopping Romney. The loony Michelle shows they are not looking for the best match against Obama, but the weakest of the bunch. But of course, it's not just Fox News. It's also the other side of the two-coin uh, controlled left-right paradigm. We were watching MSNBC earlier as people on the Chris Matthews show and other programs were also bashing Ron Paul and saying how terrible it would be if he actually won the Iowa caucuses. So what is the point of voting? These commenters are right if they're just going to bring out the whole party machine to tell everyone what to do. The founders, of course, warned about the negative influence of political parties, of the factions, should they rise to power. Now they're practically running the whole show. They not only select who we're supposed to vote for, but they try to shut out if someone outside of that party is elected. We have Paul Joseph Watson and Alex Jones report today. Branstead's act of sabotage, an outrageous attempt to tamper with the election process. This, of course, about the Iowa governor who urged people to ignore the result of his own state's caucus if Ron Paul were to win the nomination. People are going to look at who comes in second and who comes in third, said Branstead, adding if Mitt Romney comes in a strong second, it definitely helps him going into New Hampshire and other states. Of course, just another appeal to authority, even though Branstead is himself basically a de facto Mitt Romney supporter. Uh, he's closely tied with Bob Dole, who just endorsed Mitt Romney and basically promised him in the back channels a recommendation to be a possible vice president running candidate. Just totally ridiculous. Why do people obey authority? Well, we wanted to highlight uh, something that applies across the board, uh, a study that was actually conducted to find out why people obeyed Nazi orders to exterminate people in camps, the Milgram experiment from 1961, but it just generally shows why people obey authority in the first place. Uh, it was conducted by the U Yale University psychologist Stanley Milgram. It was a mock uh, memory study where they had a punishment uh, syndrome. They told the survey participants it would help people remember answers better in a memory test. But of course, it was really to find out if people would obey orders to electrocute in the experiment. Now, it was all mocked. They didn't actually exper uh, electrocute people, but it goes to show that they would obey the person running the experiment who told them to go ahead with the shocks. Now, we have a few clips from that experiment now. Let's go to the first one. When I learn of incidents such as the massacre of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people were courteous and decent in everyday life? can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience. What is there in human nature that allows an individual to act without any restraints whatsoever? It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate at Yale University. So as you see, they're asking, what is it that makes people obey authority? And, of course, they found out it's basically just that people are willing guinea pigs for anything, a so-called authority in a lab coat or a state government authority suit uh, will tell them to do. Let's go to another clip now. Now, as teacher, you were seated in front of this impressive-looking instrument, the shock generator. Its essential feature is a line of switches that goes from 15 volts to 450 volts and a set of verbal designations that goes from slight shock to moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, and finally XXX, danger severe shock. If he gets each answer correctly, fine, you move on to the next pair. But if he makes a mistake, you are instructed to give him an electric shock, starting with 15 volts, and you increase the shock one step on each error. Incorrect. 150 volts. 
sad face. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. But I wouldn't go on if I thought he was being harmed. Now this man makes disobedience seem a very rational and simple deed. Now other subjects respond quite differently to the experimenter's authority. Wrong. Hair. 75 volts, Jim. Oh. You don't know that. Please continue. 150 volts. Experimenter. That's all. Get me out of here. He's I said quit. I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. Let me out of here. Let me out. Continue, please. Let me out of here. My heart's bothering me. Let Go me on. out. Let me Let's out. Responsible for it. That is incorrect. This will be at 3.30. The correct phrase is rich Let me out of boy. Here. Let me out of here. My heart's bothering me. Let me out, I tell you. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. You have no right to hold me. answer is, Doc. 435 volts. Says danger, severe shock here. Next six on the next one. Continue, please. Born at 35 volts. Next one, brave. So that's just a few clips from some of the available films of the Milgram study conducted in 1961. The interesting thing here is that they found that 82.5% of people uh, went to 150 volts. Now, as they mentioned, it started at 15 volts, went all the way up to 450 volts, which is considered lethal. And people took those orders, 82% more than four out of five at the 150 volt level at which they first issued the cry of pain. They pre-recorded the cries of pain because it wasn't a real electrocution uh, for each participant. Now, while a few people refused, they still found that of the 82.5% who went to 150 volts and continued, 79% of those, another four out of five, went all the way to the lethal end of the line, 450 volts, obeying the authority. You heard some of the clips in there where the experimenter tells them, go ahead. Uh, some of them ask who's going to take responsibility if something happens. Uh, to the person on the other side. They say it's all good, just go ahead, and people obey. Now they did a replication in 2008 under the Berger study where they found nearly the same results. At least 70% of the participants had to be stopped continuing past 150 volts. Uh, for some reason they decided not to mimic the exact experiment, but it still brings into light that people obey orders. It's very similar, in fact, to what Aldous Huxley said in one of his last speeches, the Ultimate Revolution speech at Berkeley, and other similar speeches in his book, Brave New World Revisited, that really only at most about 20% of people are capable of independent thought. The rest either can't think for themselves at all statistically or tend to obey orders while there is some gray area there. Uh, now there's another experiment on obedience to authority. It was conducted almost a decade later in 1971 at Stanford University. That is the Stanford Prison Experiment conducted by Philip G. Zimbardo. I want to read his introduction. Welcome to the Stanford Prison Experiment website. It features an extensive slideshow of the information about the classic psychology experiment, including parallels with the abuse of prisoners at Abu Ghraib. What happens when you put good people in an evil place? Does humanity win over evil or does evil triumph? These are some of the questions we pose in the dramatic simulation of prison life conducted in the summer of 71 at Stanford University. They planned a two-week investigation into the psychology of prison life, but it had to end prematurely after only six days because the guards became sadistic and the prisoners became depressed and showed signs of extreme stress. Let's go to the first of those clips now. I, I had really thought that I was incapable of this kind of behavior. I, I was surprised you no, I was dismayed to find out that I could uh, I could really be a because uh, mm. <laughs> it was a prison to me it still is a prison to me I I don't look on it as an experiment or a simulation it's just a, a, a prison that was run by psychologists instead of run by the state I began to feel that 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 identity that the person that I was that that had decided to go to prison was distant from me was was remote until finally I wasn't that I was I was 416 I was really my number and you're not certainly not the same person as if you were in street clothes and in a different role you really 
become that person once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you put on, you take the nightstick and, you know, you, you act the part. So there you have it from the documentary Quiet Rage made with Philip Zimbardo and other participants of the experiment and how just participating in those roles worked a long way to strip their actual identity, got them to participate in the authority that's taking place. Uh, now we go, let's go to the next clip. At dinner, prisoner 416 refused to eat his sausages left over from lunch. 416. It means something to me now. As a num the number is a source of pride, like a name. It's, it's important to me that I'm 416. Get in that trial, then! He was thrown into the hole and ordered to hold the sausages in his hands. The guards threatened to cancel Thursday's visiting hour for all prisoners if 416 did not eat his sausages. 416 refused again. The guards then channeled the frustration of the other prisoners by having them express their anger directly at 416, who was in the hole. Thank you, 416. Not one of the prisoners protested the harshness and cruelty of the count. Before lights out, 416 was again put in the hole because he refused to eat his sausages, now filthy from being thrown all over the floor. John Wayne made a final attempt to get 416 to submit by setting the other prisoners against him. Now, if 416 does not want to eat his sausages, then you can give me the blankets and sleep on the bare mattress, or you can keep your blankets and 416 will stay in another day. Now, what would it be? I'll keep my blankets. What would it be over here? I'll keep my blankets. How about 546? I'll give you my blankets, Mr. Cardinal Officer. We got three in favor of keeping the blankets. We got three, guess one. Keep your blankets, 416, you're going to be in there for a while. So just get used to it. And that is some of the footage from that actual experiment. It was the part of the experiment that got them to stop it to stop that experiment, but it shows that not only do people fall into their roles of authority or, or conversely of being a prisoner, but the psychology of dominating those prisoners, of dividing them amongst themselves, getting them to participate in their own punishment by going against uh, the one who is in isolation and, and keeping their little privileges rather than rebelling against the authority figures in any way, even though they're in prison, even though they knew it was only an experiment, not a real prison that they would be getting out. So uh, let's go now to Philip Zombardo talking about why he ended that experiment. I was watching all this on the television monitor in my office with one of my graduate students. I told her that I was really impressed with what we had accomplished. In less than a week, she looked at me and said, I think what you are doing to those boys is horrible. And she was right. I had to end the experiment because that's what it was, an experiment, not a prison. These were real boys who were really suffering. And that fact had escaped me. I and everyone else around me, except for that graduate student, had gotten so far into their prison roles, prisoner, guard, superintendent, whatever, that it was hard to separate reality from the simulation. It just didn't occur to me until she spoke out that I, as a psychologist, as a human being, had to do something about that suffering. I had to end the experiment. So it's very interesting that even the man who ran the experiment set it up at the psychology department there in Stanford, himself found himself getting into the role and getting a little bit too into it. Uh, now the next clip is even more interesting. It, uh, it shows the prisoner known as 416, the one who was in isolation, speaking with uh, the prison guard who became known inside the experiment as John Wayne, the one who became very authoritarian, talking about how they still felt very personally at odds uh, from the experiment two months later. Let's go to that now. In the present tense, it harms me. How did it, it harm you? How does it harm you? Just to think it, about it, it, you mean that people can be like that? It, yeah. It let me in on some knowledge that, that I've never experienced firsthand. Uh -huh. I've read about it. I've read a lot about it. But I've never experienced it firsthand. I've never seen someone turn that way. And I know you're a nice guy. 
because I know what you can turn into. I know what you're willing to do. If you say, oh, well, I'm not going to hurt anybody. Oh, well, it's a limited situation. It's over in two weeks. Well, you in position, what would you have done? I don't know. I was, I was running little experiments of my own. Tell me about your little experiments. Okay. I'm curious. I wanted to, to see just what kind of verbal abuse that people can take before they start objecting, before they start flashing back. Yeah. Under the circumstances. And it surprised me that no one said anything to stop me. No one, no one said, Carmen, you can't say those things to me. Those things are, are, are sick. Nobody said that. They just accepted what I said. I said, you know, go tell that man to the face he's the scum of the earth. And they'd do it without question. They'd do push-ups without question. They'd sit in the hole. They'd, uh, they'd abuse each other. And here they're supposed to have a little... They're supposed to be together as, as a unit in, in jail. But here they're, they're abusing each other because I requested them to. And no one questioned my authority at all. So what's going on here is not only uh, the issue of whether or not people obey authority when in a certain situation or context, but it really relates to the larger problem of an overall rise in state power and what they consider, if you study logical fallacy, to be a logical fallacy, which is appeal to authority. We've gone from 1776 when people like Thomas Jefferson tried to make the state seal motto resistance to tyrants is obedience to God, or the alternate version, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God, to the period where people like Hitler uh, quoted Romans 13 out of context to say that obeying authority is obeying God. Now, I want to bring up this right here, the Technological Society by Jacques Elol. He's a French commentator, uh, very similar to Sir Bertrand Russell. And he writes about this overall rise in power of technological technique, which falls to the state almost by default. The state has come to be dominant in many ways. Here's a list here on page 253 inside the chapter on technique and the state. Industrial and commercial techniques of all orders, the state becomes increasingly the state boss to an ever greater degree. Insurance and banking techniques, including social security, family allotments, and nationalized banks. Organizational techniques, including the coordination coordinating commissions among all services and inspection systems, psychological techniques, including services of propaganda, vocational guidance, psychotechniques, artistic techniques, including radio, TV, and play propaganda, scientific techniques, uh, uh, that speaks for itself, planning techniques, state planning, uh, what's going to happen, biological techniques, all manner of eugenics, human stud forms, euthanasia, sociological techniques for the management of masses and the study of public opinion. So the rise of technology has coordinated with a rise in state power, and among the things you see in these kind of naked experiments of obeying authority, stuff that parallels what happened in the Holocaust, is a larger tendency to obey the state as a general authority for the masses to believe that they do have your best interest at heart somehow. I hope we can sound a warning by opening back up the chapter of 1776 and keeping people from continuing to simply obey. Now, in other news, uh, we have known for weeks, months, all coming up on a year now in a few months, the disaster that was the Fukushima meltdown. Now, Kurt Nemo is reporting that 14,000 U.S. dead in 14 weeks after the Fukushima meltdown and this headline pertains to a study conducted uh, in a medical journal, the International Journal of Health Services, which estimates that at least 14,000 people fell victim to the radiological fallout in the United States, to say nothing of what numbers may have happened in Japan. The authors write that the estimate of 14,000 excess U.S. deaths in the 14 weeks following Fukushima meltdowns is comparable to the 16,500 excess, excess deaths in 17 weeks after the Chernobyl meltdown in 1986. Most of these deaths occurred among U.S. infants under age one. The 2010-2011 increase for infant deaths in the spring was 1.8%, compared with a decrease of 8.37% in the preceding 14 weeks. Now, this goes along with the detection of very high levels of iodine-131 in the precipitation rain in the United States. 
where uh, the normal rainfall included two pico curries of I-131 per liter of water. Instead, Boise, Idaho saw a measurement of 390 pico curries, Kansas City, 200 pico curries, Salt Lake City, 190, Jacksonville, 150, Olympia, Washington, 125, and Boston, way over there, far, far from Japan at 92. So based on the continuing research, the actual death count here may be as high as 18,000, with influenza, pneumonia being up fivefold in the period in question as a cause of death. Deaths are seen across all ages, but we continue to find that infants are hardest hit because their tissues are rapidly multiplying, they have undeveloped immune systems, and so forth and so on. Very tragic consequences for those most at risk even as all the authorities in Japan and the U.S. ignored the problem of radiological fallout in the wake of the Fukushima meltdown disaster. They denied that a meltdown was happening, that the reactors were exposed, so on and so forth. And look at the consequences that this journal estimates with their scientific study may have occurred. Just tragic. Now, we're going to go to break, but I do want to remind you, Prison Planet TV depends on your support, not only to get the message out to people who are not yet in tune with the truth, but through your financial support as well. But you could do both in one blow by getting our discounted PrisonPlanet.tv memberships. You can share that membership with five other people. You can also get the InfoWarrior DVD package, 18 of Alex's films on DVDs in shiny plastic wrappers, along with that membership you could share with five other people for $129.95. Get all your Christmas shopping done at once and give the gift of truth and knowledge this Christmas instead of all the other junk you get. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned. What's up with these sorry politicians? Lots of bark. When it's showtime, whimpering like little shih tzus. You want big cuts. Ron Paul's been screaming it for years. Budget crisis, no problem. Cut a trillion bucks year one. That's trillion with a T. Department of Education, gone. Interior, energy, HUD, commerce, gone. Later bureaucrats. That's how Ron Paul rolls. Want to drain the swamp? Ron Paul, do it. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. Now we are back from break on the InfoWars Nightly News. As I mentioned, we do have coming up a very powerful interview with one of the filmmakers for A Noble Lie, as well as a member of the grand jury that investigated the Oklahoma City bombing. That, of course, is Hoppy Heidelberg. But first, a look at the situation in Syria. We have Thierry Maison's article at Voltaire.net, Free Syria Army Now Led by NATO Libya Al-Qaeda Commander. How could it be? Well, he breaks it all down here. In the wake of the Arab Spring and NATO interventions, both official and secret, Qatar seeks to impose Islamist leaders wherever possible. This strategy has led it not only to fund Muslim Brotherhood and to hand Al Jazeera over to them, but also to support Al-Qaeda mercenaries who will henceforth oversee the free Syrian army. However, the new scenario raises concerns in Israel and among supporters of the clash of civilizations. Uh, then Maison goes on to discuss how there's been reports in me recent months a certain number of Arab newspapers favorable to the al-Assad administration discussing the infiltration into Syria of 600 of the 1,500 fighters from the Islamic fighting group in Libya, rebranded al-Qaeda Lib in Libya since November 2007. In late to November 2011, Libyan press reported and attempted reported the attempt by the Zintan militia to detain Abdel Hakim Belhaj, the companion of Osama bin Laden and historic leader of al-Qaeda in Libya, who became the military governor of Tripoli by the grace of NATO. 
The scene took place at the Tripoli airport as he was leaving for Turkey. Finally, Turkish newspapers mentioned Mr. Belhaj's presence at the Turkish Syrian. Uh, and then Maysan discusses how this seems to contradict people who support the official theory can't understand how could Al-Qaeda be working with NATO, although for him it's further demonstration of something Alex also talks about, that Al-Qaeda are merely mercenaries for the CIA and related figures ever since the attacks of September 11, 2001. Well, that's how long he's been defending it's been going on before that. But who can you believe when you have Chinese and Russian press as well as pro-Assad media saying one thing and then pro-NATO papers saying another. Well, he brings up the report of one Daniel Irarty uh, from the Spanish Royalist newspaper who's completely anti-Assad, but he himself has been with the Free Syrian Army for some time and reports uh, that there are at least 600, quote, volunteers from al-Qaeda in Libya now working with the Syrian army and that they are, in fact, de facto uh, guided by Belhaj. So there you have it. NATO-backed al-Qaeda not only running the operation in Libya, but now working to undermine Syria in the so-called civil war there, more destabilization from the West in that hotbed region of the Middle East. We'll keep an eye on that whole area, of course. Meanwhile, speculation drives up food prices as bankers gamble on hunger. This is an article in the London Guardian discussing how last year the price of global food floated high as ever. That's bad news for most of us, but not for those who trade commodities. In fact, 2011 was a great year for the traders who thrive on bad news, currency woes, drought, flood, freeze, fire, and all other manifestations of imminent collapse. And this article gets in-depth into all the speculation and derivatives surrounding the new food bubble. Uh, they've tapped one Professor Yanir Bar-Yam of the New England Complex Systems Institute, uh, who's written the thesis, Food Crisis, a Quantitative Model of Food Prices, Including Speculators and Ethanol Conversion. So it's all these green policies pushing for ethanol crops, as well as the hedge fund and derivative speculators driving up the price of food. And it gets into the biofuel mandates and other reasons why there's this new casino of derivative products surrounding what everyone relies on in this world, food, and why there's so many starving people. But he has a model that is, quote, no ordinary widget. Speculation in commodity markets is not simply a matter of financial predation, the article writes. The high prices of food have resulted in accumulations of inventories at a time when people can't afford food. Then goes on to discuss how this model, which predicts food prices, also predicted the Arab Spring, including the uprises in Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, and citing food prices as one of the major factors there. Moreover, he predicts riots and revolutions will go global sometime between July 2012 and August 2013. So uh, then he calls for more international law and regulations surrounding food derivatives crisis and this big bubble. Kind of a problem on both sides because we don't want more international law guiding us, but of course we want people to be able to eat. I should point out that this entire Guardian blog was officially sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Poverty Matters blog. So uh, I wouldn't exactly call that unbiased journalism, but of course it is an issue. It's something that Lord Moncton um, and even people like Steve Shank with eFoods have talked about in depth and they've only been proven right that they're driving up the food prices for really all the wrong reasons. Not because of actual food supply that tell us that the population is overrunning the food. No, it's because of these crazy green biofuel products and just the speculation. Anyway, um, switching gears as we get ready for this really big, incredible Oklahoma City bombing interview, we wanted to bring up why Oklahoma is still important, and that is because the globalists will do it again. They've been waiting for the right time, and we're in this storm of political dissent. Uh, they're looking to crack down on this country and all of it. And even people like Glenn Beck, who've cast total doubt on 9-11 truthers and all the rest of it, have raised the possibility that the administration, Obama administration, or the Democrats, or for that matter, Glenn, anyone on the Republican side, would be willing to stage another Oklahoma City bombing to drive home a political agenda and blame their political enemies. Let's play that clip now. How can the left win the country? Watch. 
Cabinets don't don't really sell things. The president himself has to reconnect with the people. Remember, President Clinton reconnected through Oklahoma, yeah. right? And the president right because now, the he seems removed. And it wasn't until that speech that he re clicked with the American public. Obama needs a similar a similar. Kind you think of words that work for? Obama needs a similar kind of event. Oh, well, like Oklahoma City. I will be the guy who causes the next Oklahoma City. This is in a letter, an appeal to advertisers uh, of Fox, dear Fox advertisers, read this part of it. No one, left, right, center, wants to see another Oklahoma City. The next assassin may succeed. If so, there will be blood on many hands. They are setting up another Oklahoma City. They are claiming that one is coming, and they've already marked the one who caused it. I will be the guy who causes the next Oklahoma City. So what we're saying here is that there's a perfect storm of blaming domestic extremists, blaming patriots, blaming anyone who's outside of the left-right paradigm, and whereas the globalists would love to stage another event, seize more power, and corral the country back into their narrow paradigm of spectrum of thought, they will also blame anyone working outside of that spectrum, even a, a puppet uh, speaker like Glenn Beck, if they can, in order to drive home that agenda and diffuse any dissenters who have a significant voice, you better believe Alex Jones is at the very top of that list, as well as so many other great alternative news researchers. Now, uh, we do have that Oklahoma City interview coming up, but first, we want to play a few clips from A Noble Lie, an incredible film that covers so much of that very big lie, that total false, false flag in 1995. Uh, which was really just a precursor for the big one, 9-11. Let's play now clips from Hoppy Heidelberg, who we have joining us in just a few moments. Let's play the first one. It was just too important, just too important to the American people to know what happened there for me to keep quiet because nobody else was going to speak up. The other grand jurors were petrified because they observed on a daily basis the kind of intimidation tactics that were used by the Department of Justice attorneys to attempt to keep me under control. And when they found out about the FBI visits to my home, I really shook them up. Now they're even scared to talk to me in the men's room. And, and mostly, it was a John Doe 2 thing, because as you remember, it's the greatest manhunt there's ever been. And then all of a sudden, hey, he doesn't even exist. If he doesn't exist, what was the deal about the manhunt? I mean, things like that, that was continually coming out. And so we are joined now by the man you just saw in those clips, Hoppy Heidelberg. He was on the grand jury before being dismissed, as well as the filmmaker, James Lane. The film is a noble lie. We have it at Infowars.com. Powerful expose of all the story that was never told in the mainstream media at the time about the Oklahoma City bombing, as well as plenty of unanswered questions. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me now. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <clears throat> So uh, to some, try to give a basic summary of what is the compelling case here? What are the major things that people perhaps never heard about? Well, <clears throat> the bombing was designed to get the anti-terrorist bill passed. The anti-terrorist bill had been written and was before Congress in 93, but they couldn't get it passed. Uh, well, it was in 92, actually. And so in 93, they had the World Trade Center, the first World Trade Center bombing. And had it been successful, they would have been able to get the anti-terrorist bill passed, but it was not successful. And so they had to come to Oklahoma City in 95, and uh, uh, they killed enough people. They had a big enough body count in 95 uh, that they got the anti-terrorist bill passed. There were three uh, buildings in consideration, and uh, Oklahoma City won one, and I use the word strangely, but we won because we had the daycare center and we were the only federal building with the daycare center in it. And they correctly figured that it was the pictures of those little babies' bodies in the paper every morning on the six o'clock news that would get the anti-terrorist bill passed. And of course, they were more than happy to flaunt out the victims of the tragedy, but they were never interested in truth and they particularly did not want this grand jury to go forward. Uh, among other things, I've got a New York Times article from 97 with the Attorney General in Oklahoma and, and other figures saying this is a waste of money, it's useless, and we don't need this investigation. 
uh, but it's a good thing it went forward anyway. What can you tell us about the grand jury investigation itself? Well, there's actually two grand jury investigations. I served on the federal grand jury investigation that happened in 95, and then Charles Key had a multi-county grand jury seated uh, a year or two later. So uh, we need to be more specific. And, and uh, right. Mine was the federal grand jury that happened in 95 within a month or two after the bombing. Speaking of the multi-county grand jury with Charles Key, uh, they actually, once they got that impaneled, they actually turned the grand jury over to their enemy, Bob Macy, and he actually used the grand jury to investigate the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee. So the exact opposite of what it was, uh, all the signatures and, and motive behind in, in paneling the grand jury to begin with. I told Charles Key that was going to happen, and I begged him not to have that multi-county grand jury seated, and his lawyer, I have grave questions about his lawyer, his lawyer assured him that it was going to be their grand jury and they'd be in charge, and I said, Charles, it's not going to happen that way. I said, you'll be lucky if you don't get indicted, and he almost was for, for a perjury, they said. Uh, well, could you go back then to the grand jury investigation you were on, and, and what were the major <clears throat> things that happened there, including the intimidation and the rest of it, sir? Yeah, well, the, the first thing, we were given a handbook called the uh, Grand Jurors Handbook, and I studied it, and I highlighted it, and underlined it, and everything, so I was prepared. So the first day that we were seated, uh, they told us that uh, we were not going to be allowed to question the witnesses. And man, I thought, what in the world is that? And I opened my book up right quick, and of course it said that's what we were there to do. And so I pointed that out to them, and I said, I'm going to question the witnesses whether you like it or not, because the book says that's what I'm supposed to do. And we finally, uh, we took a break for a while, and we finally came to a compromise. They said, okay, you, we're going to let you, and I was the only one that was allowed to question witnesses, we're going to let you ask questions of the witness, but you have to give us the questions in writing in advance. And I thought that thought about that a minute, and I thought, well, I know how to get around that. I'll give them one question, and then after that question's answered, I, depending on the answer, I'll go to my next question, and there's, I'm not going to give them all the questions I'm going to ask, because how can I? I don't know what I'm going to ask until I get the answer to the first question. And so I got around that. Uh, but the, but it turned out it didn't really matter. There wasn't there were no witnesses that they called that knew anything about the bombing. Not a, not a thing. It was the same thing that the FBI did. You know, they've got mountains and mountains of 302s where they said, look at all the investigation that we've done. But they never asked the important people the important questions. It was just to 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 build a a, a mountain of paperwork to say that oh they had done their job. But all the people, and, and I, I can't tell you the, who testified and what they actually testified to, because that's not right. But <clears throat> the people they called to testify was somebody that had seen Tim McVeigh at a gun show years earlier. I and mean, that's not relevant at all. In fact, not a one of the witnesses that they called to the grand jury was actually relevant to the bombing. It's a, it was just amazing. It was just a dog and pony show. Shows how the judicial branch has been compromised. I mean, they were complicit in, in you know, pushing forward the official cover-up story. Well, what are the major smoking guns that, that independent investigators have discovered over the years? Who do we know that was involved other than the two accused? And, <clears throat> and uh, other breaking evidence you can give us. Well, of course, it was an inside job to get the uh, legislation passed. Uh, some of the things that we have learned since is uh, I've learned to calculate the uh, decline in blast pressure with distance so that I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no ammonium nitrate bomb exploded there. And even if there were, there's not possible that it could have done any damage because the government reported that the size of the bomb would have generated 500,000 pounds per square inch of pressure, which sounds like a lot, and is a lot. <clears throat> and of course, I was never allowed to have structural engineers come in and tell me how strong the columns inside the building were designed to be. I found out much later that they were designed to withstand 3,500 pounds per square inch of pressure. 
Well, it sounds like on the face that <clears throat> 500,000 wouldn't have any trouble taking out 3,500. But the problem comes in is when you go to calculating the decline in pressure with distance. In the formula, you have blast pressure over the distance cubed. Well, we use 10. It may have been 12. I, I didn't actually measure the width of the sidewalk down there. Because uh, when I got to it, I mean, they, they tore all that out. There's no sidewalk anymore. But it, I, I'm familiar with the building, and it was at least 10 feet. Could have been 12 feet to the nearest column. So we'll use 10 because that's easy to calculate. And you put BP for blast pressure over 10 times 10 times 10. That's 10. That's distance cubed. And you multiply that out, 10 times 10 times time, and you end up with 1,000. 10 times 10 is 100, and 100 times 10 is 1,000. Uh, so you got 500,000 over 1,000. So then you divide the 500,000 by the 1,000, and you're left with 500 pounds per square inch of pressure. Not even close enough, not any chance strong enough to knock out any column in that building. Didn't they say by the time it actually got to uh, the deepest bite in the building, it was about the equivalent of uh, 10 hair dryers? <laughs> well, there's no way that, that pressure can travel in a straight line down the front of the building in the eastward direction and then stop and turn into the building and make that large indentation and take out all of those massive columns way back deep in the building, much further away from columns that were right in front of the bomb. And I've got photos of those columns and the sheetrock is not even damaged on the bomb. You can see the gray, you can, from the false ceiling to the top of the column, it's gray, that's the concrete. From from the fault ceiling down, it's white, and that was the drywall. That was the sheetrock that was painted white. And you can see that the, the bomb didn't even tear up the drywall, the sheetrock. I mean, if it can't damage sheetrock, it's not going to damage concrete. And in the documentary, we show the actual photographs of this. Columns that were, were closer to the bomb uh, ha still has the sheetrock on, and we've got the photographs. Columns yeah. farther away were supposedly destroyed by this, you know, this uh, truck bomb with ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. Uh, we've got uh, street interviews where people, you know, that day were talking about the additional ordnance that were removed from the building, disarmed. we got people from the military talking about a second large larger device being disarmed, you know, the day of, uh, later in the day of uh, April 19th. General Parton, uh, his report shows where the additional ordinance would have to be placed to create the damage pattern that we do, that we see at the Murrah building. The, the biggest bite in the building is offset from the crater. Uh, and again, the crater was much smaller than what the, the official report says, but it, it would have had to have gone forward and taken a right hand turn. It's like the, the magic bomb, it's like the magic bullet, you know. And of course, right. the film is A Noble Lie, which I think is a great title. It brings up 9-11 uh, as well, where obviously physics is not what they're interested. They're interested in the emotional perception of this great tragedy. And, and so, of course, the media cover-up is a large part of this whole lie. Uh, could you get into some of that and what you saw with the local media as well as the national media? Well, of course, the, uh, it started out... Uh, with the media telling the truth, but that didn't last 24 hours. Then they changed everything. The only media that continued to tell the truth was Channel 4, a TV station, K4 TV station. It told the truth so strongly that it was purchased by the New York Times and every employee with that station that was working on the Murrah Building bombing was fired and not only fired but blackballed and have never been able to work in tv again another thing that we saw was um, uh, frank keating's brother martin keating wrote a book uh, the final jihad and it, it the copyright date on this was actually uh, originally 1994 the subsequent publications that came out, uh, they changed the date to 1996. Well, why is that? Well, when you look at the characters in the in the book, it's about someone setting off a, a bomb in Oklahoma City by a federal building and being picked up by a state trooper. The character's name was Tom McVeigh. And with an original publication date of 1994, now this really calls into question, uh, you know, what kind of foreknowledge that uh, the governor's office had. 
I had an appointment with Martin Keating, and I drove all the way to Tulsa to interview him. And I spent the night there and got up the next morning. I had like a 10 o'clock appointment. And so when I called him to confirm my appointment and get directions, he told me that Frank had called him. Now, Frank Keating is was the governor of Oklahoma at the time. Anyway, he said Frank had called him and told him that he couldn't talk to me. So <clears throat> I didn't get to talk to uh, Martin. Uh, later on, he said, oh, I didn't write that book till after the bombing. Well, <clears throat> I want to read you what the, his own publisher says right here on the... Uh, this right here on the front cover, I'll read it to you. The terrorist bombings in Oklahoma City and at the World Trade Center were only his first predictions. In other words, he predicted the 93 World Trade Center bombing. Now in this declassified thriller, Keating tells what's next, and U.S. intelligence agents aren't calling it fiction. Inside the cover, it said the final jihad is a prophetic blueprint a warning of horrifying upcoming acts of terrorism targeted at the United States. It's a wake-up call no one should ignore. This book was written by the brother of the Oklahoma governor at the time who had just been elected governor a few months before. He had been sent from Washington with sufficient funds to win the gubernatorial contest so that he could control the investigation of the bombing. Because uh, even though it happened in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma State, the OSBI as we call them, Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, never investigated it. The Oklahoma City Police Department, who has jurisdiction, never investigated it. Oklahoma, Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department, which had jurisdiction, never investigated it. It was never investigated by anybody except the FBI. And I believe those are the same people that said uh, Kennedy was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. Talk more, if you could, about the intimidation threats against you, but then separately, the more broad intimidation threats against patriot groups, against third-party candidate supporters in this country, and the attempt to, <clears throat> uh, to foretell another Oklahoma City-style bombing where they're just going to clamp down domestically more and more on this country as we've seen in so many cases uh, in the news. I'll start with my personal uh, experience and then turn it over to James to tell you about the intimidation of other citizens here in Oklahoma. But uh, <clears throat> the intimidation started the first day of our grand jury meeting. It continued on a daily basis uh, when it was not deemed to be effective enough uh, the FBI was sent to my home, and on one occasion, I, my office is, uh, sits in a bay window right in the front of my home so I can see people pull up, and the uh, I, and I, I got to where I could see. I knew an FBI car when I saw one because they looked, had motor pool written all over them, you know, and uh, <clears throat> so this black car pulls up and stops. The passenger, who's on my side of the car, gets out, removes a pistol from his shoulder holster, unbuttons his jacket, or it was already unbuttoned. Anyway, he sticks it inside his waistband and then buttons his jacket back, and they come in. <clears throat> and he was the bad guy. They do a good guy, bad guy routine, just like on TV. And uh, when the good guy wasn't getting the results that he wanted, uh, the bad guy stood up and unbuttoned his jacket and kind of pooched his belly out to show me that pistol. Um, I assume he was uh, trying to give me a message uh, that if I didn't play ball, they were going to shoot me. Well, I knew better than that. The FBI doesn't have the authority to do that. Uh, that's they, they have the authority to do a lot of things, but they're mostly cover-up people. Uh, so I didn't, I just pretended like I didn't even see the gun. I thought it was childish and foolish. And uh, anyway, they left a little disappointed. <clears throat> Later on, they sent another team out. And this time, one of the team members was a lady. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. I don't know what she's going to do. Is she going to try to kiss me or something? I mean, you know, how, how, how come they sent a woman? Well, it turned out she was the bad guy. Oh, man, it was funny. And uh, when they first came in and I seated them and she said, do, do you know how much trouble you're in? 
And I said, no, ma'am, but I'll bet you're here to tell me. <laughs> and everybody laughed, and that just kind of ruined the whole thing. I mean, once you make them laugh, it's not, you can't ever get serious again. So that, that interview is a complete bust. <clears throat> and I finally told him, I said, look, why don't y'all go back and tell him you scared the hell out of me? And if anybody ever calls, I'll confirm it. <laughs> and we'll just forget the whole thing because it's, you know, you guys are wasting your time, obviously. And uh, I don't mind. I, I'm, I, you're entertaining me, so I don't mind you staying here. But, uh, you know, we're not going to accomplish much here. So they left. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, I think the first group was, came down there to make sure I understood that I was going to prison and that every time I spoke out, every time I spoke the truth, was going to be one sentence, and next time I spoke the truth, another sentence, and those sentences, prison sentences, were going to be uh, done one behind the other, what do you call it, consecutively instead of... Uh, in other words, I was going to be in jail for the rest of my life if I kept talking. And uh, that's that's what I was told. And the second one, it didn't turn out very well because once you make them laugh, it's just very difficult to get serious again. Well, and we saw with uh, former uh, or retired Oklahoma City police officer Don Browning. He was part of the canine unit, and he was uh, doing search and rescue there at the uh, Murrah building. He he was asking questions about what was going on and, you know, why they were being pulled back, you know, for, for people to go out, for the FBI to go out and pick up uh, papers, you know. Uh, they, they said that there were there was documentation there so, uh, sec, you know, so important to national security that they were going to call off the rescue. Um, he's asking questions about it. One of the FBI agents tells him, you know, people like you that ask questions often end up dead. And he said the way that he was, uh, he, it was posed to him, he felt it was a threat. You know, we see the intimidation going on. You know, obviously, you know, the Oklahoma City was a precursor to 9-11. We've seen information that's come out through the MIAC reports and, you know, most recently the uh, information that Operation Defuse uncovered about the uh, internal documents calling uh, the, the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee's website uh, domestic terrorism. Anybody that has the audacity to expose their corruption and their cover-up has to be silenced. And we see that in Hoppy's case, too. You know, as he, he had the intelligence to to go in and, and ask questions, demand answers, and they weren't going to allow that because it's obvious that the judicial branch was just pushing the official story and they didn't want any interference. And we do appreciate your courage, sir. Uh, could you get into, the because the film covers so much, uh, some of the other people who had untimely or suspicious deaths and some of the victims' family members you spoke to, you know, uh, really put a profile on who the real victims of this lie were. I'll let James do that. <clears throat> well, uh, we talked with uh, the uh, mother of Officer Terrence Yakey. Uh, Terry Yakey was a real hero that day. You know, he saved eight people's lives, and he was brutally murdered, and his death was called a suicide. So the facts that surround that uh, are that, uh, you know, he had cut marks all on his arm. They said he bled out so much in the car that you could have dipped it out with a ladle. Uh, and supposedly walked a mile, mile and a half away into a field and, and with marks on his wrist and his neck uh, and then used a weapon uh, and shot himself at a downward angle far enough away that it didn't leave powder burns on his head. It was declared a suicide. You know, his family asked questions. They said it wasn't suicidal. He had everything to live for. You know, he had just, you know, he was getting promotions. He got the key to the city. He had reconciled with his wife. He had, you know, everything was going good. He had never had any, any thoughts of suicide. Um, and when his family asked questions, they said that they were crazy, that they watched too much television. Well, Terry had been saying the whole time that the official story wasn't the way it actually happened. You know, and I think that he was trying to protect his family uh, from from any danger uh, surrounding the information that he had, so he didn't share that with them. And he was going to a storage facility to uh, actually uh, work with some of the stuff that he was holding back and uh, never made it. Uh, and so it, I think it was a message. It was a message of intimidation to anybody at the time, uh, because after that, I mean, anybody else uh, that knew anything about it was silenced, you know, or else, you know, you'll end up like Officer Yankee. Um, there was uh, there was a, a lot of intimidation along the way. I know that uh, there were people that were involved with the investigation that had been threatened, um, and they just don't want the, 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 the official story to, to be questioned until it's solidified in the public mind. Well, Terrence Yankee's partner, Dr. Chumley, was also 
also killed. You might go into that. Uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> Chumley and uh, Yankee, I don't know the details of how, where they knew each other in advance. I've heard they did. But anyway, uh, they brought some of the victims. Uh, I don't remember whether ATF or DEA. They brought them down there to Dr. Chumley to bandage up, but they weren't injured. And Chumley said, hey, I don't have time for this. Said, These boys aren't hurt. And they said, ah, we need you to bandage them anyway. And he said, y'all get out of here. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And supposedly, from what I've heard, uh, Yakey was there and witnessed that. And from that point on, Yakey and the doctor, uh, they rented him a lockbox, uh, I think, in a bank at, at uh, uh uh, the town off from Oklahoma City, I forget which one. And uh, they went to putting together documents and photos and things like that because they both realized that this was a complete bogus operation, that it would, wouldn't anything like what the government said. And so uh, they apparently obtained all that documentation uh, from Yankee before they killed him. And then it was some months later, I think, when uh, Dr. Chumley's plane went down. Yes, sir. Uh, in closing, just as James and the other filmmakers are bringing this case back out into the light, you disclosed early on the radio, you, you've got a medical issue and you're probably not going to be in the spotlight yourself. Uh, but what would you like to tell the world uh, about the importance of this case and looking forward what it means for, for our country uh, as other events are possible as they continue to try to clamp down on this country and, and put forward a, an evil agenda? If the American people are not willing to believe what I say and not willing to believe what they know beyond a doubt happened at 9-11 and know beyond a doubt that JFK wasn't killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, I mean, everybody understands that. If those people are not going to do anything, if they're going to sit idly by and pretend they don't know the truth and pretend they don't want to do anything, we're going to lose this country. That's a fact. I, my only hope is that God won't allow us to lose this country because he has a, an investment in it. But I, I don't know that for sure. And uh, so I think he's our only chance because it looks like American people are not going to wake up and take any action. And Aaron, this is why it's important for the viewers to go out to the InfoWars store, get a copy of the movie, share this with your friends and family, and expose the methodology of state terror. It take away their power to perpetuate false flag attacks to for their own political ends. Hoppy, thank you for your courage and to all the filmmakers of A Noble Lie. And they're right, if we don't fight back against the stage terror, they're going to continue to use it against us and enslave this country, try to pull the wool over impressionable people's eyes with more and more media lies. Of course, we do have that film, A Noble Lie, at the InfoWars store. We also have a Christmas special right now at Prison Planet TV. You can get a big discount on a membership that you can share with five other friends, family members, whomever. You can give them the passcodes uh, coming up this holiday. You can also get 18 DVDs all in the shiny package with that yearly Prison Planet TV membership for $129.95. Excellent discounts, great way to give truth this Christmas and holiday season. Uh, and for the InfoWars Nightly News, we thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be back again tomorrow.